OK, uh, we'll get started. So in the previous class, uh, we were discussing the following, uh, following thing. So we wanted to, so this is the problem in the previous class that we got stuck on. So I have a matrix I minus alpha B. I know that real part of lambda I of B is greater than 0. So I'm going to write lambda I of B, the ith eigenvalue of B as AI plus J B I. And AI is greater than 0 and j equals to square root of minus 1. j is a complex number here for this example. So I know that the eigenvalues of this is given by 1 minus alpha ai minus j alpha bi. And the goal for us was to find an alpha so that the spectral radius of i minus alpha b is strictly less than 1. So question was find alpha such that rho of i minus alpha b is less than 1. Alpha has to be greater than 0 because that's the step size. And the point where we were stuck, we found out absolute value of lambda. This is given by 1 plus This is an absolute value of a complex number. So this is the complex number, and I'm just taking the absolute value of it. Okay. So the question is how should we proceed? So I want the absolute value of lambda i to be less than 1 for all i. That's when the spectral radius will be less than 1. So I want this to be 1 for all i. How should I find the value of alpha greater than 0 such that that holds? What should we do next? Minimize, minimize. OK. I, I mean, that's a reasonable solution, but complicated solution. Because you have i, i such values, right? So are you going to minimize i such functions of alpha? Yeah, but this cannot be 0 because alpha is positive, ai is positive, alpha is positive, and bi could be positive or negative. So I can't make this go to 0. So let's uh, look at this particular inequality. And let's do some reverse engineering. OK, so I'm going to assume that there is an alpha that satisfies this, and I'm going to find the range of alpha. So I have 1 plus something less than 1. What does that imply? Yeah.
alpha AI. Okay, so now I'm going to move things around. So I have alpha square AI square plus BI square is less than two alpha AI. Okay, now let's notice. Is this term strictly greater than zero? Yes. Because AI is greater than zero. So this implies that this is strictly greater than zero. Alpha is strictly greater than zero by assumption because that's the step size, so I have to have a positive step size. So I can divide them, like take them on the other side, and I get alpha to be less than two AI over AI squared plus BI squared. And this has to be true for all I. And this has to be true for all I, for all I, and for all I. And notice that this term is positive. Okay, this term is positive. So alpha is less than some variable, I mean some, some constant for all i. What does that mean? If I pick alpha in 0 and then min over all i, 2i over ai square plus bi square. So this is open interval 0 comma min of this expression, then I will have rho of i minus alpha b strictly less than 1. My spectral radius of this matrix is going to be less than 1. Okay, any questions so far? It will be greater than zero or it can go less than zero? The spectral no, the, the spectral radius can go less than zero. Uh, sorry, the spectral radius cannot be less than zero because it's an absolute value of eigenvalue. So it can either be zero or greater than zero. Okay. So what we have done so far. Uh, because I can pick a step size alpha in this particular range, it implies that the rho of i minus alpha b is less than 1, which would imply that the Lagrangian method converges to, the first, to a point which satisfies first order necessary conditions for optimality. So this implies xk plus 1 and lambda k plus 1. xk minus alpha and lambda k plus alpha. So I cooked up this algorithm. This was the Lagrangian method. I cooked up this algorithm and after applying a lot of complicated results, what I have done is I have established that this algorithm is going to converge if you start sufficiently close to x star and lambda star. This converges to x star lambda star, which is satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality.
what we have also done in this process is provided you with tools and important results so that you can cook up your own optimization algorithms. Of course, it's going to be difficult because a lot of those algorithms have already been discovered, whatever were the easy ones to discover. But nonetheless, in the future, if you want to design your own algorithms, optimization algorithms, then you can design it. And the way to go ahead and prove that it's going to converge is using the approach we have just developed in the last one week of this, of this class. So contraction mapping theorem coupled with one of the results that we talked about where the spectral radius rho of gradient of h y star is less than 1, then you can apply the contraction mapping theorem to show convergence to y star, which is what we proved in the previous class. And then we proved some auxiliary results to show under what conditions the Lagrangian method converges to the first order necessary condition for optimal solution. OK. So this is the general recipe what we have done so far in this class. We talked about optimization. We have, we have discussed optimization algorithms for optimization over convex sets. And you have done a few assignments on that. And then we have talked about barrier method uh, for inequality constraint problem. We have talked about augmented Lagrangian method and method of multipliers for equality constraint problems. There are extensions to inequality constraints also, which is given in the book. We didn't cover it in the class. But the ideas are very similar. And then we talked about sequential quadratic programming, which is a very, very powerful algorithm for solving uh, complicated optimization algorithms. And then we talked about Lagrangian methods and the convergence uh, proof for Lagrangian method. Now, that ends our discussion on optimization algorithms that are uh, based on uh, this notion of K like the, the, the KKT theorem and some consequences of KKT theorem. So we talked about a lot of these algorithms so far. Now, we want to change gear, and we want to talk about an important concept within optimization called duality. OK? So this chapter has ended. So now we are on chapter 5 of the book, or maybe chapter 6 of the book. Duality. So this is the, so what we are going to do is we have been talking about the space Rn and how you get, how you converse to the optimal solution within this space. Now we are going to look at some other space. So this is our current problem. I want to minimize f of x such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. And I'm looking at this space Rn. I have g1 of x equals to 0. I have g2 of x equals to 0. In this region, g of x is less than or equal to 0. And within this place, we can draw the contour map of F. So this is F equals to 500. No, let me write F equals to minus 1, F equals to 1, F equals to 3, F equals to 5, F equals to 7, and so on. Right? So these are contour maps. So these are the points at which the function takes the same value. So this is the curve along which the function f is equal to 1. This is the curve along which f is equal to 3, and so on.
Now here is the problem. In this case, my x was in Rn. Now consider the following problem. I want to minimize x in 0, 1 raised to n, f of x such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. So now I have a binary variable or a sequence of binary variables, 0, 1. And I want to optimize a function subject to some constraints over those binary variables, uh, the set of binary variables. OK? I mean, you can change this binary variables to anything else, like, like the set of natural numbers or some discrete set or discrete and continuous set and so on. The problem is, so far, whatever we have studied cannot be applied to this setting. Because in this setting, the set itself is not dis it's discrete. It's not continuous. It's not like a subset of Rn so that I can take a step. I can only jump. I cannot take a step in this particular space. So the drawback of thinking our optimization in this way is the fact that we need Rn so that we can take a step and, and move in any direction we want to. So what should we do? How should we think about problems of this type? Which which, by the way, I want to come up with a general theory so that I can view problems of this type and I can also view problems of this type. Okay? I want to be able to unify the two different types of problems into a single framework, single mathematical framework. So this is how this notion of duality came in. So now instead of looking at Rn and looking at contours of F, and then g1 of x equal to 0 and g2 of x equal to 0, I'm instead going to look at g of x along x-axis and f of x along y-axis. Okay? Now, g of x is, no matter which function, which optimization problem you look at, g of x is going to be a real number or a, or a real vector, and f of x is going to be a real number uh, in, in, in no matter what x, what the underlying space of x you are using. So I can draw the set of all fx gx pair that are achievable within this particular set. So I'm going to draw something like this is the set of gx comma fx pairs for all x in capital X. So each of this point within this set this set, oh, it almost looks like an apple. Uh, so every point in that set is actually a GXFX pair for some X in capital X. Can you have two values of F of X for one value of Yes. OK, so here is an example. So I want to minimize x such that x squared is less than or equal to 25. So for x equal to 3 or plus minus 3, your fx is different, but x squared is the same. g of x is the same, right?
So this is in the continuous case, this is what your f of x, g of x is going to look like. In the discrete case, this is what your f of x comma g of x pairs are going to look like. This is the discrete case, this is the continuous case. Now I want you to look at both these graphs and try to tell me what, where exactly does x star sit? In other words, where, what is the gx star comma fx star in this graph and what is the gx star fx star in this graph? Think carefully, okay? Remember that we are looking at points where gx is less than or equal to zero and I want to minimize the fx. So where exactly does the optimal solution sit in these two figures? Who said that? Yeah. The lower left corner, so this one. This is your g of x star comma f of x star. Same thing here. This is this point is my g of x star f of x star. So at this point, so when is gx less than or equal to zero? Well, it's on this side of the axis. G of x is less than or equal to zero. And at which point f of x is minimized, so I have to look at the lowest point in this particular region, and that's this point. And the same thing happens here as well. This is the point at which f of x is minimum, and g of x is less than or equal to zero. So what we have done is, instead of trying to look for solutions in this way, where I start from some initial point x, and then I get to the optimal solution, x star. I'm going to change my point of view, and instead of looking at the space Rn, I'm going to look at this space gx comma fx, and I'm going to try to find this particular point in the space, okay, in this particular space. And the duality theory is basically a, the, it's the mathematical structure under which we try to see view problems, view optimization problems with this lens, not that lens, okay? And we will soon, we will show maybe in like next week, early next week, that for convex problems, the two different points of views coincide in some way. Okay, any questions so far? I'm going to erase everything on the board. Okay, no questions. So here is the problem, I want to minimize f of x such that g of x is less than or equal to zero, x lies in some capital X. And the examples of capital X could be, could be Rn, or x could be 0, 1 raised to n, or x could be 0, 1 raised to n cross Rn.
Okay, so now I can look at any general set. I don't have to just restrict myself to Rn. Because now I'm not going to optimize in the space of x, I'm going to optimize in the space of fx comma gx or gx comma fx. All right. Let the minimum value be given by f star and assume that f star is bounded. It's not infinity. I'm also going to assume that there exists an x such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. So there is a feasible solution. I, I can't try to solve the problem minimum of x such that x squared is less than or equal to minus 1. I mean, there is no feasible solution to this problem. So I'm not going to consider these kind of absurd problems. Okay, so there is a feasible point in the set and the f star, the optimal value is, is strictly less than infinity. Okay. So definition. A vector mu1 star to mu r star is said to be uh, the geometric multiplier for the primal problem. So this is my primal problem. If and only if mu j star is greater than or equal to 0 and x star equals to argument L of x mu star x in capital X. There is a small change here. So f star equals to min x in x L of x mu star. Yeah. So I want my geometric multipliers to be non-negative and I want the minimum value of the Lagrangian well, I could actually change this minimum with infimum. Infimum value of the Lagrangian at mu star should be equal to f star, which is the optimal value of the problem. Okay. Let's try to look at an example. I want to minimize e raised to x such that x is less than or equal to 0. x is in R. Yes. So, inf, uh, yeah, so the notion of inf is similar to the notion of min. 
In the min, you assume that a solution exists to the problem. In, when you use, when you don't know whether a solution exists or not, you use inf because you don't know if there is a minimum. Okay. What do you think is the solution to this problem? I know that it doesn't have a solution, but what looks like a solution to this problem? When is e raised to x minimized? x equals to minus infinity. So it satisfies the constraint. And at e raised to minus infinity is 0, and that's the minimum value e raised to x can take. So I don't want to say it's, a, it's not a point in R. Minus infinity doesn't belong to R. But we understand what we are talking about here. It's like a solution, but not really a solution. Which is why I wrote in here. So my f star here is equal to 0. f star is equal to 0. What that means is my uh, infimum is equal to 0 for this particular constraint optimization problem. So what is the Lagrangian here? It's e raised to x plus mu times x. Does this problem have geometric multi uh, uh, Lagrange multiplier? Can I define Lagrange multiplier for this problem? Can I define Lagrange multiplier here? Not really. I cannot define Lagrange multiplier because Lagrange multiplier theorem implicitly says x star is optimal. Here there is no x star, so there is the hypothesis doesn't hold. And therefore, there is no Lagrange multiplier here. Because no optimal solution. So one thing to keep in mind is that in this particular example problem, there is no Lagrange multiplier because it, there is no optimal solution to this problem. And when there is no optimal solution, you cannot define Lagrange multiplier. It's just, it just doesn't exist. But let's see if this problem has geometric multiplier or not. So I'm going to claim that mu star equals to 0 is a geometric multiplier to this problem. Why should that be the case? Let's look at n for This x is in R. So it satisfies the definition for being a geometric multiplier. So we have here a convex problem. The objective function here is convex. The constraint is convex. So it's a convex problem. Uh, so I have here a convex problem, which doesn't have a solution, which doesn't admit a Lagrange multiplier because there is no solution. But it has a geometric multiplier because it satisfies, because mu star equals to 0 satisfies the definition for being a geometric multiplier for this problem for this primal problem. So what this is exhibiting is 
that even though you may have problems where there is no Lagrange multiplier, you could have geometric multipliers. Because the way geometric multiplier is defined is very different from the way Lagrange multipliers are defined. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about, so we have this particular uh, 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 gx and fx space. So gx is, this is my rr R, and this is my r. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about hyperplanes in this space, rr cross r space. I have a hyperplane like this and the normal to this hyperplane is given by vector mu1. Now of course you can orient this uh, hyperplane in any way you want but I'm just interested in hyperplanes where this mu is non-negative so you could have hyperplanes that look like this. You could have hyperplanes that look like this. You could have hyperplanes. Well, it can't be vertical. A vertical hyperplane does not have mu. And it can be something like this. Okay, so these are all the hyperplanes that have mu non-negative and 1 as a, as a normal to the hyperplane. Okay, so let's draw a new graph. This is my R. This is my RR. R. And I'm going to define a hyperplane with normal mu comma 1. Now every such hyperplane divides this, uh, this space into two parts, two halves. And this is the positive hyperplane and this would be the negative hyperplane. Oh, sorry, uh, negative half space and positive half space. This is the positive half space. And this is the negative half space. Okay, so I have a hyperplane in this space and once I draw the hyperplane, I see that there are two half spaces. One is a positive half space which is sort of above the hyperplane. The other one is a negative half space which is below the hyperplane. Let's see why we call it positive half space and negative half space. So this is my line with normal mu comma 1. What is the equation for this line? Can someone tell me what the equation for this, this hyperplane is? Anyone remembers? So it will be mu transpose, this is the z, this is the w, yeah. 
mu transpose z plus w equals to constant. How do we know what that constant is? Well, I pick any point here. Let's say uh, z bar comma w bar. That's the point I have picked. Then the c is same as mu transpose z bar plus w bar. Everyone familiar with this stuff, the equation for the hyperplane? So if we know the normal to the hyperplane, then the equation for that hyperplane is given by the normal uh, transpose the, the, the variables in the space z comma w equals to some constant. And the way to compute that constant is by picking some point on the hyperplane and just evaluating this side which is what I have done there. So in the positive half space, what I am going to observe, if I pick a point in this particular half space, I will see that mu transpose z plus w is greater than or equal to c. And in the negative half space, I am going to observe that mu transpose z plus w is less than or equal to c. That's why it's called a positive half space and negative half space. Okay. Right, so, so this hyperplane is included in the positive and negative half spaces, so therefore it's greater than or equal to, but every point here will be strictly greater than C. Every point here away from the hyperplane is going to be strictly less than C. Okay. Okay, any questions so far? So we have understood a few things. The first is what's the equation for the hyperplane which is given by this expression. We have understood what positive half space means and we have understood what negative half space means. Now let's apply this hyperplane idea to the gx and fx space. So I have this set I'm going to call it equal to S, which is the set of GX comma FX such that X is in capital X. This is my hyperplane, and let's say I have a point here, g of x, f of x. So there is uh, some x, and that point g of x, f of x is on that hyperplane. Oh, and I have to draw the normal which is mu comma 1. That's the normal to this hyperplane. Can someone tell me what is this number? So let's look at this expression here. What is this intercept? 
C. This is exactly equal to C. Why is this C? Because at this point, Z is equal to 0, right? So Z is equal to 0. So W equals to C. So this point is actually C. This is the intercept. This C is the same as this C. Okay. Now coming to this expression, what's the equation for this hyperplane? Mu transpose Z plus W equals to mu transpose GX plus F of X. What is this term? It's the Lagrangian. It is L of X mu. So what is this intercept? L of X mu. Everyone understood this? Okay, I'm just copying the same thing from here. In that particular graph, I'm just giving it a different name. So now I'm looking at a point GX FX on this hyperplane. Turns out that the Y intercept is L of X mu. Okay. Now, what happens if I translate this line up and down? Okay, so let's go back to this figure. What happens when I move this trans when when I translate this figure this uh, hyperplane up or down? What happens to the intercept? The intercept changes, right? So if I if I draw another hyperplane like this, which is parallel to the original one, then the normal doesn't change. The normal still remains mu comma one, but the intercept has changed, right? So let's try to do the same thing here. I can look at this hyperplane. I can look at this hyperplane. Or I could look at this hyperplane. OK, all of them have the same normal. This is mu1, mu1, mu1. What is this value? So remember, what is happening in this graph? So I've, I have shown different hyperplanes with the same normal. They all have the same normal. But the funny thing with this hyperplane is it touches this set capital S exactly at one point. OK? And at this point, let me call it g of x bar f of x bar. What do you think is a property for this particular intercept? There is no mu star. Mu star, I mean, I have fixed mu here. You are close, but you are not, you're not, you just have to think a little harder. It has something to do with x star. The problem is that there is no mu star here. It's, the mu is fixed. No, it cannot because this is not the Lagrange multiplier. This is some mu that I have picked. I just picked mu from my from my, uh, uh, just pick some random mu. And I'm looking at these intercepts. And this is a valid intercept, this is a valid intercept, this is also a valid intercept, and this is also a valid intercept. The thing is, 
if I draw any line below it, which is parallel to this line, I won't be in the set capital S anymore, right? I'll be outside of the set S. So this intercept actually is infimum of L of X comma mu, where X is in capital X. This is the minimum intercept you can get. You cannot get an intercept lower than this for that value of mu. Okay. Okay, so so far I have, what I have done is I have fixed a hyperplane, I have fixed a normal to the hyperplane and I have translated the hyperplane and I have found out what is the minimum intercept. Well, the minimum intercept is infimum of L of x comma mu for all x in x. So now we have given a geometric meaning to the Lagrangian, okay? Yes. It's not an x star, it's just it's not an F star either. Yeah, it's not an F star either. So let's look at this place. And now I'm going to just look at the, the hyperplane so that this entire set S is in the positive half space, okay? So remember this hyperplane, the entire set S is in the positive half space because it is above the hyperplane, not below the hyperplane. So now here in this particular figure, I'm going to draw different, different hyperplanes such that the entire set S is in the positive half space. So I can draw something that looks like this. I can draw something that looks like this. Or I can draw something that looks like this. Okay, so let's say this is mu one, one, mu two, one, mu three, one and I get three intercept. I get this intercept, this intercept, and this intercept. Let me call this, this is So I showed you three different intercepts for three different hyperplanes. These are all n over x. Okay, so time is up, so I'm going to end here. But in the next class, we'll pick up this particular figure and we will tell you what is so special about this particular hyperplane, mu3, comma 1. Okay, we'll talk about that in the next class. Thank you for your attention.